Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives Podcast. Today we're talking about international friends. I'm Jen Mathiasen, an objects conservator based in South Yorkshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Greater Manchester. And today we have a special guest host. Special guest. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I will. I am Neris Rudder and I am a conservator and collections manager based in Barbados. So I thought because this is kind of an international episode that I would basically steal some international museum news from the museum's journal because... Scandal. Yes, I know, because they actually have a great World News Digest section and I love it. An International Design Museum of China has just opened, for example, which is pretty amazeballs. A 20 billion contract has been signed between Saudi Arabia and France to help transform the Al-Ula region into a cultural tourism destination. Oh, wow, I think I heard about that. Which is uh, fantastic and it'll be Saudi Arabia's first UNESCO World Heritage Site as well, so... Great really? news for France and Saudi Arabia. And we've had a bit of a kerfuffle with the, the Brooklyn Museum in America because they they appointed a, a white curator of African art, which was a bit of a faux pas. Ah, um, yeah. And they, they have stood by the decision and they have given rationale for why. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's been a debate. It's <laughs> been a debate. Uh, a very hot topic. Speaking of which, I just saw an article which was about uh, a museum going to sell off some of its uh, art to like Warhol and stuff like that. <gasps> to uh, instead focus on buying art by women and by people of color and i, I thought that. this was an interesting oh, there's a debate and a half in that well it yeah. is that's true i thought it was really interesting an interesting argument because they were obviously selling off some really famous art mm-hmm. but also by trying to uh, use that money to diversify their collection which mm-hmm. i'm totally in favor of so it's an interesting one right yeah. Whereas like yeah, but then maybe they're just, you know, spreading the more more famous art, but differently famous art uh-huh. to other collections, hopefully public ones. Yeah. And also uh, minority artists get a go. That's amazing. I'm kind of in favor of that, even though it's the accessioning, which I kind of hate. Um, Although um, I'm just writing down Selim Museum objects <laughs> as a whole episode topic. <laughs> <laughs> god i should oh, never man. have mentioned this oh, I'll, I'll put an art i'll put a link to the article in the show notes um, um i yeah I, I saw that as well um my partner messaged it to me this week and oh it's muddy yeah i mean there's a lot to be said there's a lot to discuss it's definitely not uh just a simple issue is it but oh, it's, it's never going to be maybe simple another, m- another topic oh yes yes absolutely <laughs> no, i just want to open that but, can of worms and leave it there <laughs> um i would have to lean towards um jen's view that yes you it is important to diversify your collection if you've got three or four war halls you know yeah. and you can you can get through with just two um <laughs> and at the same Muddle time through. You're, you're giving uh you're giving access and advocacy for minority uh, people of color and and women artists. I think the context is great, but but I will agree with Chloe that you know you do need to know the full story behind it. Yeah. Because it, it that could it it sounds very good, but there's always you always want to check behind the scenes and see what's actually going on. Yeah. yeah. Are doing I, it. I feel like um, the article did a good job of like looking at different things because it mentioned that Egyptian statue that like mm-hmm. a local council in here in the uk try to export and like reasons behind why you might be selling off collections yeah and sometimes mm-hmm. it's the motives are not honorable or the but, end yeah. doesn't justify the my means, concern is as soon as you start giving people i've got we're having a big old chat about this now yeah we Never certainly mind. are it's good it's all good i feel like as soon as you start whatever the reason as soon as you start saying you can sell museum collections it's like that starts a floodgate essentially of museums being pressured to sell collections instead of getting funded but that i mean it's a very sticky topic I, yeah i would yeah. i'd say well why can we not diversify collections as well like don't get more warhols get everything <laughs> else like, <laughs> is it an issue of space is it an issue of money is it an issue of of display potential like what what is it that what is it that means that we can't diversify our collections without selling with, off without yeah. selling yeah. off like what why is it mm. why is it this big new and like, surely this is just something that we should have started a while ago like it's it's a big issue but it doesn't need to be like this giant groundbreaking thing oh we've got to shut the whole museum down mm. because we want to get some women artists in oh, oh yeah yeah. Like, mm. anyway mm. 
Sorry, anyway, that's a, that's a future topic that you may enjoy in more depth. So yeah, that's international news and we've already stirred up some <laughs> haven't we? <laughs> well, it's because everything is, everything's very exciting and important. Today, this episode is about you. Everyone working worldwide is about you. Yeah. We spend a lot of our time talking about our experiences in the UK, personally from the UK and have not ventured further afield all that often for reasons of time and money and fear of flying um <laughs> and insects um jenny has been in all sorts of exciting locations um, but not necessarily as a conservative but not such. necessarily as yeah. a conservative I- and we've slowly real well quite fast i suppose realized that our listener base is worldwide we didn't anticipate Brilliant. this we're super excited yeah. about it yeah and we would like to acknowledge you all and also say thank you so neris <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself. You have studied in Cardiff. A coincidence, of course. Certainly didn't (laughs) sit opposite each other in the lab. Yes, Chloe was my godsend. (laughs) (laughs) You you invited us in and you were so helpful and so so kind with us strange in a strange place T- talking about the fact that we were that you know the difference between international versus uk um conservators of the seven of my year two and a half were british mm-hmm. and i'll say two and a half because i am a dual national so i i do acknowledge my half but you had uh you had taiwanese you had uh, american you had barbadian um and so i thought that that was really quite interesting um, how international Cardiff's course was. I don't know how that is in comparison to other courses, but I certainly appreciated it. I, I agree. Uh, it was really Definitely nice. I agree. Yeah. Because I feel like my first degree, the university was very like white middle class and I was very much seen as a bit of an outlier in not being from the UK. Mm-hmm. So coming to Cardiff and walking into a room which was full of people from america uh, other places mm-hmm. in scandinavia cyprus greece all of these wonderful locations it was the best mm-hmm. thing ever it was just like oh my god i'm home yeah. which i mean i don't in belong the here either <laughs> it's like, nobody really belongs here this is great <laughs> so this this is everyone's turf this is fantastic uh the it was family really of misfits <laughs> yes uh, it was fantastic so what led you to the course neris tell us a bit about your background and your your roots um well as i said i'm a dual national but i grew up in barbados and then i studied i actually first studied industrial design at central st martin's went back and then fell into curating and collections management for a national art gallery project um, for quite a few years. And so it was it was different. <laughs> then in about 2011, 2012, after eight years of managing conserva- um, conservation projects, not actually doing the conservation itself, but setting up temporary labs for the conservators that were coming in from Puerto Rico and one or two from the UK, I was gently persuaded by some colleagues that I should actually go and study conservation myself. And I was like, no, 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 I don't have chemistry. I, you know, I, I cannot be a conservator. I don't know this. And um, they were like, no, you should do that. It was the hardest, most rewarding thing that I've ever done. It was two years of, I mean, you can imagine somebody who'd been in the arts for however many years to suddenly do a science degree as a mature student. It was I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I decided I was going to do this, but I did, and I must say, it it you know it really opened my eyes up. And to cut a long story short, I then became a conservator. So I returned back to Barbados in 2014 after completing the MSc, and I have been continuing working. I was self-employed before and I am still self self-employed which is again challenging but rewarding but now I can add conservator to my business card and that's what I do oh that's a good story yeah so that that's the potted history of my of my time at that Cardiff uh, so Naris how when you're working you've you've got your um, private practice mm-hmm. and your conservation qualifications and your skills do you have a lab or a studio how does that work out do you go to places uh, go out to places do people call you what what is what is your what is your normal day for you look like 
<laughs> um, I can't say I've ever had a normal day. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a small a small lab that I built or renovated a garage into a small lab at my house. And so if the work is portable or, um, and, you know, I can fit it in my station wagon, I will actually bring it home and work on it there because I can then control the environment and I then also have access to a lot of the chemicals and and tools and such that you don't want to be traveling around within your car. Mm -hmm. Um, um, But I have also set up temporary labs in archives, in museums, um, you know, in in various places. And when you say temporary labs, I should really say temporary workspaces. And so uh, sometimes we're hosted by various places. For instance, my most recent big job was hosted by the West Indies Federal Archive Centre. Um, those ladies are absolute treasures. Um, and we were working on the magistrate's journals of uh, the St. Kitts National Archive. Um, so these were some 19th century stipendary magistrate's journals. And... So we actually created an entire activity, including workshops and videoing the work. And so that was set up at the at the centre that was hosted by the centre. But mostly I would do work from home because I have, you know, I have the sink space. I have my various tools and everything set up there. Cool. Uh, what's your favourite? <laughs> have you got a favourite standout um, object project in the last four years that sticks in your mind? Oh, if we're, spe- if we're talking specifically about conservation, I'm going to have to go back to the, the Stipendary Magistrates Journals from St. Kitts National Archive, just because it was really exciting because I was able to actually bring in a consultant conservator, Anne Bancroft, who, who is also uh, Barbadian and um, English dual national. Um, she's a, a senior book and paper conservator. And I'm going to say that this this was a standout for me because it wasn't just conservation. It was being able to project manage and bringing in a friend and a colleague and working together. It was being able to put up to, to set up workshops so that we were able to um, communicate some basic skills to archival um, technicians in Barbados and also we were going to be doing a little uh, video short. And so setting up that project as well, all of the extra bits to the project made it really, really stand out for me. But then actually working on the journals themselves, they are so very, very important because they're like from the 1800s, late, mid to, to late 1800s. They're not that old um, compared to even Barbadian history that can go back. Recorded history goes back to like the 1600s. They're important because after, so the apprenticeship system took over from the slavery, from slavery in 1834 and the freed slaves had to then work for their old plantation owners. Oh, wow. But for yeah. the very first time in history, the previously enslaved could complain about their treatment and could take people to court and could then give evidence against people and then also have the judgments, if they were in their favour, be carried out. Oh, so this wow. is the very first time that black people were in the Caribbean were actually getting their advocacy. Oh, wow. And it was incredible. And so we were working on these journals and these, these records. And so that's why that was so very, very important to me. Yeah. That's why that that, um, that job was, that, that particular job was so important. It was in St. Kitts, but this is recording Caribbean cultural heritage. And so as a Barbadian, it was exceptionally important for me as well. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant example. That's so yeah. lovely. That's amazing. So studying in the UK, are there things, and I'm thinking, I think as as a British person, I'm obsessed with the weather. <laughs> so <laughs> when I say, when I say things that we learned about environmental controls and things um, around that, essentially what I'm, I'm saying is, do you feel that there are huge differences in the way that conservation and collections care can be carried out in Barbados compared with how you were taught in the sort of tepid 
wet <laughs> UK, but we've really got nothing to whinge about because you know most of the time it's 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 all right. It's Nobody has to worry about TG. Wet. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody has to worry about glass transition temperatures. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, B7, Paraloid B72 is every UK conservator's best friend. The oh, glass yeah. transition temperature is 40 degrees. <laughs> so oh, yeah, no. I can feel it's that that drops everybody. in popularity quite rapidly as you approach the equator. Yes. <laughs> And that's something that I never, I never considered, really, yeah, in my kind yeah. of, oh, I'm just, oh, yay, Coop, brilliant, thanks for telling me all about B72. It does what? At what temperature? <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, so that that's basically, you've just addressed the biggest issue that every every small island or every tropical or any kind of country that doesn't have a winter and doesn't have you know that 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 change of seasons that's the issue that we face just elevated everything you've got elevated <laughs> you've got elevated relative humidity which is usually in barbados it's usually about 65 to 80 percent then you've got temperatures which are usually about 30 to 32 degrees mm. and Christ. then you've got that wonderful sunlight everything that makes it such a wonderful place for a person to go and, and uh, holiday yeah, I is can see exactly some issues here. <laughs> what makes it horrible for for collections the lux levels are just off the charts you know our sunlight you know, I was the person always asking, OK, so um, at, 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 by time in Cardiff, I was a, I was asking, OK, so you're saying that the relative humidity should should not be above 55 percent. What happens when it's 65? What happens when it's 80? Mm -hmm. Because I was thinking about the environmental conditions that I knew that I would have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And most people were like, well, um, <laughs> you know. get a giant expensive machine to bring it down for you <laughs> yeah so um and you know so we've got incredibly elevated um, environmental conditions compared to europe and the americas that's a given on top of that funding is a huge issue for you guys but we are actually a post-colonial um, we're a post-colonial society that that are, are dealing with funding issues that far, far outstrip what you guys mm -hmm. are, are oh, yeah. dealing mm -hmm. with. And, you know, I'm not trying to say, you know, oh, you know, we have it worse than you. This this is just the a fact that we have. So, um, so we don't have very many institutions that can that can put in 24 hour environmental controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the air conditioning. They have the air conditioning on, and then they turn it off when they go home. Yeah. <laughs> so the air conditioning's <laughs> on from nine till five, and then then it gets turned off. And so you have to say to them, actually, no, that's worse. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, fluctuations. Yeah. <laughs> so a big part of what I do is is advising common sense cheaper alternatives to environmental control. The the best thing that I the, the one tip that I give everybody is to invest in standing fans because air circulation means that mold cannot propagate easily even when you've got a higher higher relative humidity and temperature so movement of air um, have even though you might have corresponding issues with dust having the windows open so you can have airflow within a historic house is it's a trade off and something that you might that, that they might want to look at because that you know that they can't air condition the room pests because we have such wonderful environment, nice warm environment, we have 365 days a year of which pests just love to propagate. <laughs> um, so, you know, we don't have that lovely winter where every everything dies down oh, yeah. for a little while. You know, it, it's a constant. And so pest control is a going concern and something that we always have to face. So, yes, the environmental factors, the lack of funding, pest control, and also the just awareness of heritage and how to take care of objects those are the areas that we're always working on those are those are the those are always the opportunities that we're that we have to teach people to be better caretakers of their um, tangible heritage mm -hmm. is it like i think in terms of people taking care of their tangible heritage i think it's essentially it's poorer communities who they don't have the privilege for heritage to be a priority because they are mm. they're mm -hmm. they're too busy actually just 
surviving and living and working on just being their own level of prosperous and happy in their own lives. Is that an issue in a country with with that is struggling for funding? That heritage is is all well and good, but actually I'm just getting on with my life. Thank you very much. And is that is that uh, is there the level of interest in heritage is that, that there is in uh, wealthier countries that have essentially the the time to care <laughs> I suppose is what I'm saying I'm, I'm, I don't really know how to put it but yeah no I, I, I totally get where you're going I think that <clears throat> I'd have I, I'd say that I, I don't quite agree <clears throat> in Barbados there I think what we I hope <laughs> what is is um is more true is that people do see the value of their cultural heritage mm-hmm. when you are a tourist-based community when you um, when you when you are a service and tourist based uh, service industry and a tourist based community you do look on your heritage as a money earner mm-hmm. as much as a yeah as much as also a repository for your cultural heritage for your identity mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. a community and again this is something that a lot of post colonial countries do deal with I think more so than, say, Britain, because the majority of the population would have had an incredible amount of their cultural heritage taken from them. And so now within cultural, within tangible and intangible heritage, you're seeing uh, people embracing the, the tangible and intangible because it reinforces your identity and your cultural mm-hmm. heritage. Mm-hmm. But I will completely agree with you in terms of when you have more access to wealth, you have more access to fu- to museum funding. Mm-hmm. And it is true that, you know, when you when you are working class or when you are when you don't have that, that access to funding, you are more concerned with survival. And unfortunately, people I think across the world are then, okay, well, what why is this then so important? Why is this mm-hmm. object so important? Why are museums why should we we be funding museums mm-hmm. when we're trying to fund the schools or we're trying to find, exactly. fund the hospitals? Mm-hmm. I feel that it's it's been a massive oversight from the um, UK and European scientific research mm-hmm. in conservation to just to not consider the differences in in environmental conditions worldwide. That, mm-hmm. I, and I, I suppose in in a sense you can only expect people to deal with the situation that they are in. But really, it's it's sort of it's such a pity that essentially your your life is being made just a little bit more difficult because all of the books were written by people who were just sort of swanning about in completely <laughs> ambient conditions <laughs> and like, I, oh, I yeah, feel it's that it's degrees it's so yeah <laughs> I know it, it just it seems like it's um had we been more considerate we could be going in leaps and bounds really further from where we are now um, and again, this is, I mean, it, th- I have no solution. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, it's just a statement, really. No, no, but you are the solution. I, 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 I disagree with you completely, Chloe. I think you are the solution because what you're doing right now is opening the, the conversation to everyone. Um, the International Institute of Conservation and the Palace Museum in Beijing have a wonderful uh, training program um, where the Chinese government are basically inviting international conservators to the Palace Museum for these workshops. And I was very, very lucky to be on the inaugural one in 2015. Um, we had Velson Hari and Sarah Stansforth and illustrious tutors um, speaking with us. And uh, But what was m- what was most important was that we had participants from Canada, America, New Zealand, India, all across China, Hong Kong, little old me from Barbados. Um, I'm sure I'm missing out a whole bunch more. I'm, I'm so sorry for, for all of my colleagues who are, who are missing out. But what we, we as a community brought to the table was an understanding that we are all from different environments and what is different, what can help each other. And it was really an international gathering and the i mean the networking and that alone was just fantastic and you know i came away with some fantastic i came away with some friendships that i still actually 
I'm, I'm maintaining today. But it was one of the first conferences, programs where I was very much aware that they were acknowledging and dealing with issues that faced us all. We do have common issues. We also do have very disparate issues. But in being able to discuss all of them, we're all coming away with a better understanding of our craft. And that is so very, very important. When you are focusing on yourself all the time and not looking at your community, be it a, a, like a worldwide community or even you know a museum community, not looking out to see who, who's, who is your community locally, you are shooting yourself in the foot, really. There is something very wonderful about um, international conservators coming together because this is the second year that we ran a taxidermic conservation course with Simon Moore here in Rotherham. And both times we've had a really good turnout with people from all over the world. And uh, I think it's been really entertaining for my colleagues who maybe don't often get like an international crowd come rocking up. Because, mm. <laughs> you know, they were like you know, people from Portugal and the Netherlands and uh, america and canada there was someone from china last year i want to say then we had people from scandinavia and uh this year we had someone from brazil and you know it was just it's it's astonishing and lovely and great to all be in a room together and be like whoa you traveled far that's fun <laughs> why, why are you here what kind of stuffed animals do you have you know it's just this odd little sharing where it's like oh my god I have a parrot and I don't know what it is. Is it from your part of the world? Please help me. I have no idea. Um, and it's just this wonderful little moment of everyone kind of sitting down together and realizing that, oh, yeah, we're learning something together and we probably have similar issues. Even if in the fine detail it might be, I can't get this because this particular product is from North America and it's not sold anywhere else or or mm. constraint is a type of pesticide that only exists in the UK and is now mm -hmm. being phased out. Uh, you know, all these tiny nitty gritty things you can all go away and think about but like the kind of holistically you're all there learning to put glass eyes into animals <laughs> <laughs> so neris we've asked everyone this uh, it's the most important question <laughs> it's very i think central to everything that we do as conservators in the world what's the scariest thing you've ever found in a pest trap yeah <laughs> um I'm going to say that it wasn't actually in a pest trap. It was in my bedroom. Oh, that's worse. <laughs> when, <laughs> that's when so much worse. a centipede worse. that was about eight inches long. Oh, gross. <laughs> yeah. That's gross. Oh, my gosh. Because it was so large that if it had been caught in a pest trap, it would have shrugged that. Yeah, right off. <laughs> it would have crawled away with it. It would have become like a little snail house instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, my God. Um, that's gross. Yeah, so we're, we're we're talking about those horrible ones that bite you. Oh, and oh God! You, oh. Yeah, this is not the house centipedes that you know you're walking around. Oh, it's a little centipede. No, we're talking about those things <laughs> that literally I shriek and <laughs> run from because they are actually poisonous. Oh, that's oh, grim. Uh, <laughs> that's grim. So, yeah, that that's very grim. That, but um, the scariest thing is uh termites oh, oh no, god yeah certainly in the uh in the tropics we have three different termites that we deal with a lot um that's subterranean dry wood and then what they call them termites in in barbados but they're not actually they're they're um wood boring beetles mm -hmm. um but the powder post beetles basically um and those are the scariest because that means that you have an infestation mm. and you're you're going to have to deal with a lot of chemicals. Oh, that's, um, not, that's not fun. Yeah, and and then and usually the the problem with with pest control in a lot of countries it, is that we're dealing with a lot of toxic chemicals mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are not as heavily regulated as in the UK mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and America, and so public knowledge is not is not that that, that great. And I do, I have had on many occasions had to counsel people that they have to wear the appropriate PPE when they're dealing with these chemicals yeah. because they just think, oh, yeah, we can just do it and, mm -hmm. and go along. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so that's the scariest by far. But the scariest for me personally is that big old sucker. Ugh. of a <laughs> 
Oh, wow. And I did kill him. Sorry to the to the conservators that I know that would have said, no, put him outside. No, I killed him. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neris. You're welcome for bringing up that horrible memory. <laughs> sorry, we can cut that out if you like. Uh, I'm sorry. No. Oh, just <laughs> but, be, before you know. before you go, I'd just like to ask: What do you think the biggest difference is between working in like Western Europe and like Barbados and surrounding area? What's the, what are the biggest differences culturally? Do you think? Okay, so we spoke about uh, the environment. Obviously, the, mm. the environmental issues are so much larger. Access to materials, access yeah. to um, archival quality ma- materials is so much harder. Mm. We, we just don't have the manufacturing of them. And so we, we need to import everything. Um, and so that's a huge issue. Awareness of, of conservation as a career, mm-hmm. awareness of conservation as a, as a, a viable career. Is, is one <laughs> um, so, you know, people's public awareness of of all of the all of the of the jobs behind a museum that that support a museum that make it what it is the lack of physical community i am literally the only conservator on island right now and so it can be quite lonely yeah yeah so the, those are some of the things but i think that you know anyone who's who's working within a small community where they don't have the access to the facilities, they don't have the access to materials, and they don't have the access to um, their colleagues, feel the same way. You know, it it can be very, very lonely, and it can be very, very isolating sometimes. Mm. And that isn't dependent on whether you are working on an island per se, or you're just working within a community that doesn't quite understand you. Yeah. And so that, yeah, so so those are some of the things that that, um, I've noticed the differences of oh thank you so much for talking to us Nira. thank it's you been so an much absolute oh. pleasure oh, speaking of international friends you re- well not i suppose not recently now but in november in november <laughs> you interviewed someone for this episode <laughs> i interviewed the lovely lovely rosie cook she came to visit the studio in, that i work in on a grand tour of the uk um as far as i could tell anyway i interviewed her and asked her some of the questions we've been talking about today So today I'm speaking to Rosie Cook, an international conservator. Thank you for speaking to me. It's my pleasure. So you trained in Australia and you've worked all over. Um, To start with, can you tell me where you've worked in the world? Uh, It's actually mostly been focusing on the Asia-Pacific region. As you say, I trained in Australia and that's in Melbourne. So a lot of the volunteering and small projects that I've done have been in Melbourne. Then... I did an internship in Taiwan last year, uh, which is a country I've spent a fair bit of time in over the years, and that was based in Taipei, with a few side projects in Kaohsiung. And I've also been really lucky this year to be involved with projects in the Philippines, um, in the island of Bohol, and also with the National Museum in Manila. That sounds amazing, seeing as I've only ever worked in the UK, (laughs) possibly only (laughs) moved a couple of miles every every year. Um, Do you see many differences in practice between the places that you've worked? It's really interesting to see how conservation is kind of growing and changing in Southeast Asia. And a lot of the institutions that have started off with practices as as deemed the most uh, the most suitable, perhaps in Northern America or Europe, Western Europe, and are starting to adapt to the local climate and also, you know, just the general institutional requirements. So I guess it's most interesting is the difference is in how we perhaps prioritise access to the collections and assess condition of the collections or the display of the collections based on the restrictions that are imposed by things like climate. That's a, I'm really interested in the differences between climates of different countries because obviously in the UK we we complain about the weather all the time but we're actually <laughs> we're pretty lucky. So on to the, to the next question, uh, what are your favourite things about working in um, Southeast Asia? And then we'll get to your your least favourite struggles. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe climate will be one of those. Um, yeah, definitely non conservation related. It is pretty awesome getting to work in such beautiful and warm countries. I have been 
whinging a little bit about the cold since I got to England. <laughs> so maybe November. end of it's November. November. <laughs> yeah, November wasn't the best time to schedule a trip. I think one of my favourite things of work about working in Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific region is I'm really interested in working with world cultures. You know, what has been traditionally called ethnographic co- collections, and we're really trying to push for, and you see this a lot in New Zealand and Australia, but to avoid that sort of othering notion of ethnographic being other cultures because often we're working directly with people from those cultures uh there's a little bit uh, trying to step away from that othering notion of ethnographic and that's why i and many other conservatives refer to it as world cultures the advantage of course is therefore that it's much easier to build connections with the community of origin and to set up living links around the intangible cultural heritage of the objects that we're working with to see ourselves as conservators not just of the material but the full significance of those objects and even just understanding consulting with makers and artisans on what the materials are that we've used and how's the best way to continue caring for them that's so lovely and that's such a lovely sort of holistic way of thinking about objects and their lives and what makes an object important. What have you found to be the main struggles in working in, in these climates, in these areas, I should say, rather than to lead your answer? <laughs> yeah, it's not really a leading question in that climate is probably the number one issue. Well, climate combined with funding, because in an ideal world, every government would set aside huge chunks of funding to ensure that cultural heritage institutions are kept in pristine condition. So the problem with trying to apply ideal museum standards in a climate where outside it can be 60% humidity and oh 35 <laughs> degrees and that's just every day and then you've got during the rainy season it will be raining two, three times a day, these monsoon type when the sky is just open and, and you're completely drenched and even just getting into the conservation studio, you're trying not to drag in oh my God. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> muddy water. <laughs> so managing not just the heat and the relative humidity and the pests um, is quite nerve-wracking. Trying to find methods for handling the pests, particularly if it's in Bohol, for example, we were handling collections that had been affected by major weather events, uh, huge earthquakes and typhoons and flooding. And you know that there are pests in the collections and the easiest way to treat that would be a heat treatment. But just because in Europe they say, oh, if you raise it above, you know, 40 mm-hmm. degrees, or whatever, mm-hmm. I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, that will kill off all pests mm-hmm. at all life cycles. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be true for insects that are used to living and freeze treatment generally is a lot more expensive to do mm-hmm. when you're trying to get to reach cold yeah. temperatures uh-huh. so heat and cold can be a bit of a, a tricky solution that mm-hmm. you're not certain is actually going to be a final solution <laughs> the <laughs> benchmarks yeah. so different yeah oh, wow so yeah handling the climate and the extreme weather events uh, in Taiwan where I've been working most of this year We were working in a heritage building, a beautiful building. There aren't that many in Taipei, so it was a real privilege to to get to work somewhere so beautiful. But leaky roofs that we know there's a typhoon coming. When there's a typhoon, the city shuts down. You get most people excited. Yay, typhoon day. We get a holiday. (laughs) Yeah, when the typhoon comes, uh, business stops and you're supposed to stay home. And for the conservation team, we're nervously messaging each other going, oh, "Oh, I'm so scared to go in. Can you go in on Monday? Because we were closed on Monday. Can you go in on Monday and just check if there's been too many leaks? And you get there and yes, there's been a leak. And then you start, you know, mopping up and cleaning after the flood and you discover that there's also been insects that were hanging out in this crack of the roof. (laughs) Oh, no. But, uh, But it's also part of the fun is that we try not to compare ourselves too strictly to the yardstick of what a great institution in New York or London mm-hmm. might be doing. The priority, at least for the museum I was working in Taiwan, which is the Taiwan Pu- Asian Puppet Theatre Museum, the priority for us there was definitely to think about it holistically in terms of the significance of the collection and not obsess too much over the material condition beyond stabilising mm-hmm. it. What is the scariest pest 
because I mean I think people are up and down with insects but <laughs> I've never considered the tropical pest trap hunt <laughs> um I haven't had too much interaction with scary pests and Having lived in Australia on and off for most of the last uh, 10 okay, years, yeah. <laughs> um, I've learned to be a little bit more relaxed about, you know, scary in terms of just a uh, nightmare for anyone to come across a spider this big. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, for the, for the recording, she's demonstrating a spider roughly the size of her head, which just isn't okay. <laughs> it's not okay. But they're not really a threat to the collection other than an indicator that, you know, you need to yeah. seal off, make sure things are properly sealed off. I think it's just the frustration that uh, in Taiwan, well, as in most places actually, uh, there are insects everywhere and you have to be so strict about food around the, around the collection areas because there are cockroaches anyway mm-hmm. and cockroaches the size of, you know, I was going to say size of your cell phone, but cell phones have grown in the mm-hmm. past. So <laughs> maybe not quite iPhone size, but the big cockroaches, and it's always unpleasant to open a drawer. Like it's a shock anyway when you open a drawer and you find an, an, a big cockroach, but it's an extra pang of guilt and horror about your poor, precious collection. Mm-hmm. If there's a cockroach hanging out here, there's probably more in the storage oh, room. Oh god, yeah. But in the Philippines, what was a bit of a, a nightmare story with pests? was wood termites um, because I was taking care of a church collection. I was meant to go Mm -hmm. in there and just clear out. It's sort of a bit of a voluntourism thing, but as conservatives going in and and Mm -hmm. helping out, there's a storage room that was full of uh, church church paraphernalia, Mm -hmm. sort of Mm -hmm. wooden statues of the saints, Mm -hmm. santos, and relics and textiles. There's often Mm -hmm. a lot of ecclesiastical vestments and we were working under quite uh, difficult conditions because they were only had to we only had daylight mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so we had a fairly narrow window of time moved everything out of the storeroom me and Liz the conservator I was working with and then discovered that the shelving unit that they were being stored on was completely infested oh, with no. termites and we had about two hours before it would get dark. Oh my so gosh. we had no choice but to put everything back in the storage room, trying to keep it as far away as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the roll of plastic with us. It wasn't, I, I think it was, uh, it may have been PVC or something. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than nothing mm-hmm. in those emergency situations. And made a plan to go back the next day and we were going to fix everything up so that this would be safe until the t- the what termites mm-hmm. could be killed off and then there was a threat of a terrorist attack and we weren't allowed to oh go back God. <laughs> and instead of worrying about terrorist attacks we were going but the collection such a conservative <laughs> thing to do <laughs> the book book are gonna get to the santos because of course some of the objects you know are sort of soft and squishy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they've been feeding a oh, nice family no. of termites oh, you get over the squeamishness just because of that you know the attachment that you, you have to, to materials and particularly because that it's a living collection Mm -hmm. that the parishioners are really attached to that is being taken out and used you know in different Mm -hmm. different times of the year according to different festivals Mm -hmm. our bus that was that that was during easter so it was even everything shuts down for easter and it's big celebration time all the santos are coming out on display and we're just thinking how are we going to make sure (laughs) (laughs) but fortunately there was no terrorist attack and we were able to go back. We were given two hours to go back in. It was a bit like a pressure test okay. from Master Chef. <laughs> <laughs> so on the journey there, we've got our notes and like comparing. Mm-hmm. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Get in there. Jump in. Get everything stacked and stored and protected as much as we could because mm-hmm. uh, you never know when the next earthquake or flood is going to come along. <laughs> I will never whinge about Manchester traffic ever again. <laughs> Uh, okay, so final question. What are you working on at the moment as an overview of what you're doing at the moment? What's life like for you? It's pretty busy. It's been a really amazing year. I've been running around a lot. So I'm currently, I've just finished up working at the Taiyuan Asian Puppet Theatre Museum in Taipei, as I briefly mentioned. At the same time, I'm organising a symposium about an Indonesian bamboo instrument that I was lucky enough to work on last year during my training, and it turned out to be a gateway to this incredible community of musicians and revivalists, and we've done a few workshops in Indonesia, and yeah, this year, not next year, February, we're organising an event in Melbourne 
with all kinds of uh, interdisciplinary conversations around the significance of that mm -hmm. instrument and getting to collaborate with musicians when you're conserving a, music, a rare musical instrument oh, wow. is such a privilege. Except people expect me to be able to play it now and I have no <laughs> musical talent whatsoever. And of course, fortunately, I'm really lucky. I've got a job lined up next year setting up a textiles conservation studio in Taiwan. So fingers crossed that all goes well. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. I feel like I'm going to need it. <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much for speaking to the c -word. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. Looking forward to listening to your podcast again soon. No. <laughs> oh, that's a really lovely interview. It was so nice to meet her. It was really yeah. nice to talk to her as well. And talking to her was um, one of the reasons that I came up with the... Well, we thought of this idea and thought about the, the breadth of experiences that we all have over the world. And yeah. Really, really lovely. Well, so thank you so one. much, Rosie. Oh, my God, though. Leaks and monsoons. What the hell? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I find it difficult enough to handle copious rain in Yorkshire. I think it's it's from from talking to Rosie and from talking to Neris just now, the breadth of things that we just don't have to deal with in the yeah. UK is, is amazing. And we don't yeah. consider it. We just we just whinge about oh my feet got damp on the way to work. <laughs> Woe is me. <laughs> uh, also cockroaches. Ew. <sighs> yeah, I thought that the the worst answer would be like giant spiders because I hate spiders. But I think you know. So next up, it, yes, thank you to everyone who sent us voice clips. We thank asked, you so much. We asked on social media for uh, conservators around the world to send us uh, voice clips, you know, of their experiences, and you've all been amazing. And you know, sent us stuff. It's great. Put so much effort in. Put so much love into their yeah. fantastic recordings. Uh, we were really overwhelmed with the um, interest and the attention that everyone has paid to this it's been so lovely we are kind of blown away by how far this is this podcast has spread and who listens and who wants to get on board um so thank you so much everyone yeah so um yeah let's listen to some of you now hi everyone my name is julia betancourt and i am a conservator and restoration of fine arts in madrid Spain. My academic background is coming from Complutense University in Madrid and after that I have been training and learning in several places around uh, the world like Florence, London, United States. I have been working on this from more than 25 years, almost 30, as a private service working for museums, institutions, corporate collections, and more private society in London, Italy, France, United States, Portugal, but mainly in Spain. My best project was in late 90s, the most important and whole Baroque chapel in Toledo, in Spain. This uh, chapel was destroyed by fire and I was working during more than two years. And the most strange thing that I have done there was maybe to have my hands the bones uh, from a famous Catholic man. It was a really scary, really carry bones. But recently, one of the most scary things was to find behind a panel art canvas destroyed by water, the mold. And this panel was plenty of black mold and uh, I didn't have the proper mask for that. I hope you enjoy my history. Have fun. Bye. Oh, first of all, I love her accent. That's amazing. Um, but then I'm a sucker for accents. So okay. <laughs> um, oh, can can you imagine holding a saint's bones? That's kind of cool. Human remains, people. Amazing. I know. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks very much, Julia. And uh, next up, we've got someone from Norway. Hi, everyone. My name is Piet Grist, and I am a object conservator currently working at the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo, Norway. This museum is one of Norway's largest museums and holds the country's largest prehistoric and medieval collections. And we also have the best preserved Viking Age boat in the world. Here at the museum, I work as an archaeological conservator, meaning I foremost care for and conserve the archaeological collections. 
This consists of newly excavated material, but also objects in storage. My work at the moment is very much focused on loans, but also exhibition work. But how did I end up here in Oslo? I'm originally from Sweden, from a small village called Lysvik in the midwest of the country, where there is more uh, forest and lakes than there's actually people. My family has always been into old things, and my grandfather and father was furniture restorers. Going to auctions were a kind of family fun that we did at the weekends. I knew already early on that I was going to be something to do with history. And I had a huge love for Egypt, which of course I still have today. Uh, My first degree is in history and art history and archaeology. And that's from the University of Karlstad, Sweden. During these years, I was quite confused about what I actually wanted to do. Until a student guidance counselor told me that there is actually a profession called conservation. And I think that you should be a conservator. And after this... I started my degree in conservation and I never looked back. But that's not true, is it? Because, of course, when you start as a conservator, you're always doubting yourself and you think that others are much better. And it's hard to get the contracts and it's hard to get to work, etc. But you don't give up and I'm happy that I didn't give up. Being a conservator is, is part of who I am now and I wouldn't want to do anything else. Anyway, uh, my first degree is from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. And I I specialized in the conservation of archaeological material, but also the conservation of general cultural heritage material. After my first degree, I, I worked foremost in the UK, but also in Norway. And I realized early on that I needed a master's degree to compete with others. So I decided to apply to the the master's in project-based conservation at the University of Oslo, Norway. My first project, no, my my project was accepted and I was then based at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, UK for about two years. After my, my degree, I stayed in the UK and continued working in London until I got the job here in Oslo. When it comes to fair favorite project or object, it's such a difficult question. I have been involved in loads of rewarding projects and most of all, they have been developing and challenging, which for me is the two key elements. I always want to learn something new and take on a new challenge. Conservators are problem solvers, and as a conservator you always learn, and will never be fully educated or done. This ex- this really excites me, it means forever learning. To me, finding a favorite object or project feels impossible. To me, it's also more about material groups, like ethnographic material and human remains, that are very challenging when it comes to past context and use. I think us conservators need to talk more about these aspects. I can basically be here all day telling you about my exciting objects and projects. I think this is also related to just being a conservator. We are a bit obsessed with things and we love what we do. Conservation is definitely a passion and I feel privileged every day. And I also think working on short contracts have made me appreciate every object and project even more because I can't be sure when or if I will get the next contract. Quite sad, but very much real and true for a lot of us today. From one subject to another, pest traps. Sadly, the scariest thing I have found in a pest trap is a very large spider. Otherwise, I have just seen commonplace museum pests. Thank you very, very much. Oh, another Scandi. Hi. <laughs> You're going to say something in an amazing language. Uh, no, but I'm going to say, tax <laughs> mucket. This, this one was so similar and I suppose to gracias my... to uh, Julia as well. <laughs> oh, God. How, have we signed up for something that we can't can't continue with the, with languages? Well, yeah, probably. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so, Pia, that ex- I really hear you about your experience um, with confidence in the first years. It is so hard. Yeah. Also, I'm. I wasn't really expecting anything particularly exotic in the pest trap, <laughs> given that it is Scandinavia, <laughs> and I don't think we have anything that that's scary. Although big spiders are quite scary. Oh yeah. I mean, normally other people just fetch me. There's a spider in there. I'm not dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> 
You don't have to. It's just there. Just leave it. No. <laughs> it creeps me out. It's looking at me. It's dead. It's not looking at you. <laughs> and next up, we've got someone from the Netherlands. My name's Abby, and I work as a paintings conservator at the Maurits House in the Netherlands. I got into conservation because of the combination of art and science. Uh, first, I wanted to be a dentist. Then I made my own artwork combining art and biology. Uh, but then I decided I wanted to be a paintings conservator. Uh, and I trained at the Courtauld Institute in London, then moved to the Netherlands in 2005. My favorite project, uh, it wasn't a conservation treatment. Uh, I was the head researcher for a technical examination project where we used the latest non-invasive methods to examine the Maurits House's most beloved painting, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. And this examination took place in front of the public over a two-week period with machines running 24 hours a day. The logistics were pretty challenging, but it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience to hold the curl with the pearl earring in my gloved hands. I'm not the one in our museum who checks the pest traps, but uh, we did recently find a huge wasp in the cupboard where we keep our coffee mugs. Thanks for the great podcast. Thank you so much, Abby. So Jenny's looking up how to say thank you in Dutch, so we'll see how that pronunciation goes. Um, <laughs> my thoughts on that is you you held what that is amazing i'm i'm a little starstruck on your behalf actually that is that's is amazing are you gonna go for it with the dutch well i think it's thank you i should really click the thing shouldn't i thank you. yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> i might do that without the obvious google in the background and <laughs> uh, next up we've got someone from germany hello this is a message for the sea ward my name is Sophie and I work in Berlin for the Antiquities Collection, although I'm on maternity leave right now, so I have the time to answer these questions. Um, how did I get into conservation? I wanted to work with art, but I wanted to avoid being an artist because I didn't feel very talented. So this is how I went into conservation of art. And um, I trained First of all, three years of internship training in Berlin and Hamburg for various conservation companies. And then I studied stone conservation in Hildesheim at the University of Applied Art and Sciences and graduated with a diploma there. And which was my favorite project or object, which is a very difficult question to answer, I thought. But um, one work experience which I really appreciated and remember very well is a archaeological dig in Sudan somewhere in the middle of the desert and I spent there several weeks conserving objects which were on site um, some stone columns and statues dating from the Meretic times this was just a great experience. The work was interesting, but also the surrounding, living there in the middle of the desert with uh, nomads and uh, camels and um, yeah, some strange events, uh, a, a Sudanese wedding that we could be part of. And yeah, that was just a very exotic experience. The main experience or the main uh, challenge of this work was, uh, as in other projects as well, was the communication, especially in international projects. The intercultural aspects are always very challenging and being able to communicate with each other in the same conservation language was, was difficult there. So as I do not look into pest traps, I'm very lucky that other conservators do that in our collection. Um, I can just tell of one event which was quite funny and sweet and also a little bit scary in the beginning, that um, working on a facade of a church in Austria, I found a little uh, bat, a very young little bat, which was sleeping on the facade and was just hanging there, but it was... 
after several days, we reached this area and thought, well, we really need to clean this area of the facade. So we tried to find out what to do with this uh, bat. And we saved it in the end in a little box and uh, we were able to, to pet it. And um, then we gave it to an expert for bats with, who, who informed us about the, the race and the kind and the special needs of this bat. So that was quite interesting and funny. Wow. Uh, first of all, uh, danke schön, Sophie. And then, wow, you're working, you were working in the Sudan as well as Germany. How kick-ass is that? That is amazing. I'm so excited about how conservation takes us everywhere. We're talking about a fantastic experience to hear about. Thank you so much. I also love the idea of conserving around an animal. Oh, that's the cutest that story. story oh. ever. Yeah, definitely winner of cutest story. Definitely. Uh, next up, we've got a listener from Egypt. Hello, good morning. Honestly, it is first time to record my voice by my smartphone. And also, it will be in English language because my mother language is Arabic. So I am sorry for any mistakes in my conversation. I would like to thank uh, C World Group that enables the conservators to share their information, knowledge and experience with other conservators around the world. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Jane Henderson for sending this great event to me. Firstly, my name is Abdelaziz Maraski, conservator at the Grand Egyptian Museum Conservation Center, GMCC. I am specialized in the conservation of ancient Egyptian meter artifacts, whether cover, bronze, and silver, etc., etc. Uh, it is expected that the Grand Egyptian Museum will be partially opened in 2018. Most of Tutankhamun collection has been transported from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo to the Grand Egyptian Museum Conservation Center in Giza for restoration, conservation, and preparation for exhibition in the King's Hall. In 2018, the complete collection, collection of Tutankhamun will be displayed for first time in one place, from small objects to huge objects, all of them. So I hope this museum is able to attract a lot of tourists to come back to Egypt again. Firstly, I graduated from Faculty of Archaeology, Conservation and Restoration Department in 2009. I am still working in my master thesis that took an apart uh, treatment and the conservation of Asian silver artifacts. In 2012, I worked as a meter conservator in the Ger Anderson Museum in Cairo and moved to the Grand Egyptian Museum in 2015. So I am working in the Grand Egyptian Museum from 2015 until now. I think I am very, very lucky because I am working with ancient Egyptian artifacts. And, uh, you know, uh, ancient Egyptian artifacts is still peer a lot of secrets that have not been revealed yet because it's a, uh, it, uh, the, these objects have many information concerning sources of this metal, burial environment, mechanism of corrosion, manufactured technology of these artifacts, and finally, all the restrictions after discovery. I think the role of conservator is not only protect the uh, archaeological objects from further damage or preserve uh, the current state of artifacts, but also the conservator should be aware how the object was made and also cooperate with a lot of archaeologists and scientists to broaden his knowledge and gain more experience. In 2016, it was the first challenge because I received 38 cover miniature holes from Tutankhamun tomb. The accident of damage to 
the copper miniature hose differs from one to another. Some of them were covered with a pale blue corrosion product, red spots, a black layer, a green corrosion product, and scratches, and were cracked and brittle. So, my task was to identify the chemical composition of unusual pale blue corrosion product and the corrosive environment before selection the most appropriate approach to remedial conservation. The pale blue corrosion product is a rare phenomenon in cover artifacts in the Egyptian museum in general, so it required detailed investigation and analysis such as XRD, scanner electron microscope with LX, FTIR, and sample tests such as flame test. The final analytical results indicated that corrosion product is sodium carbonate acetate. After I checked the analytical results of this corrosion product, after using many analytical techniques, I wondered myself what is the source of sodium and acetate in corrosion product. Actually, the presence of sodium demonstrates that some of them were cleaned with either sodium hydroxide or uh, sodium editor or sodium sesquicarbonate or other solutions containing sodium. On the other hand, the presence of acetate ions in pale blue corrosion products gave an indication. This miniature hose were stored in wooden cupboard emitting organic vapors like acetic acid in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo before transporting to our museum. So, it was concluded it has been formed because of reaction of remains of previous chemical treatment and volatile acetic acid vapor in wooden cabinets with cover servers for long period of time. And I checked in database, I found in this object where already stored in wooden cupboard in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo before transporting to our museum. So that's make me sure 100% in the acetate source was emitting from wooden cabinets. These results was published as a poster presentation at ICOMCC conference in Copenhagen in 2017 and the final paper will be published in the near future in international journals. So thank you for attention. Bye bye. Oh, very well done. That is not bad. Um, I have no idea how to say thank you in Arabic. I'll have a go. Oh dear. All right, I'm having a go. Shukran Abdul. <laughs> thank you so much for your English is amazing. Thank you so much for um, all the work you put into that. I know that uh, it's difficult of us to ask everyone. Oh yeah, thank you, international conservators. Now speak our language. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit actually. <laughs> Um, also, you have access to some really fantastic scientific resources. Oh, yeah. I don't have access to any of those analytical like methods. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. You're very lucky. And excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your research as well. And now over to a listener from America. Hi there. This is Fletcher Durant, and I'm the preservation librarian at the University of Florida's George A. Smathers Libraries. I first got into conservation as a volunteer at the Library of Congress, and then a few years later, I went on to graduate school at the University of Texas's Kilgarlin Center to become a book and paper conservator. My favorite project has probably been working on the United States Sanitary Commission papers, which was a very large collection of documents held by the New York Public Library. Uh, the main challenges were dealing with the size and scope of the documents, some of which were very large wall posters up to, I think, 11 feet long. They were great. 
Uh, and then the scariest thing I've ever found in a pest trap, I would have to say a bed bug just for the creepiness factor. All right. Keep up the great work on the podcast. Ugh, bed bugs. That's gross. <laughs> well chosen, sir. Well yeah, chosen. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much yeah. for sharing. <laughs> Florida sounds like an amazing place. Yeah. And uh, now we've got uh, something from a listener in Australia. Kia ora, seawooders. Uh, my name is Edna, and I am a founder and proprietor of Tiaki Objects Conservation. Uh, Tiaki Objects Conservation is a small private practice that I actually founded last year after working a number of years at Melbourne Museum. Just like many other places, I guess, Australia hasn't been left out. Uh, there are a number of institutions which have lost a lot of funding, so it has meant that uh, there's too many conservators, not enough jobs. So I took that into my own hands and I decided, right, I'm going to actually start myself a business. So that's what I did. So um, I am based in Melbourne, in southeast Melbourne, in Frankston South, and I have been operating as a private conservator officially since February last year. So I work quite a lot with very um, with small um, collecting organisations, small museums, uh, local councils, and heritage and historic societies, which is really really great actually. I got into conservation a long time ago now, actually, and it was a little bit by fluke. I was at the University of Auckland, and I was actually training to be an archaeologist. Um, I had done all the papers that I re that were required to actually become an archaeologist. However, when it came to actually doing the practical aspect of it, so the field school, uh, at the time it clashed with something really, really important. And I can't remember quite what it was but it meant that I couldn't actually um, complete the full requirements needed to be an archaeologist. So uh, that put, that sort of put me at the post a little bit. So I ended up completing the degree. I did my bachelor's in anthropology and Māori studies. My Māori studies aspects, um, so Māori studies is um, indigenous studies, and I concentrated quite a lot on the material arts, so learning about traditional Māori culture, um, replicating material uh, manufacturing techniques and preparing traditional Māori fibres, that sort of thing, and actually recreating tools and materials used uh, by the Indigenous Māori of New Zealand. I carried on and did, um, did my honours degree and actually came out with a, an honours degree in Māori material culture. I used my grandmother as my inspiration, I guess, because she was a traditional Māori weaver. So uh, it was my uh, lecturer who actually planted the seed, so to speak. And she was the one who informed me of the degree that was being offered at Melbourne University at the time. So I did a little bit of research and found out, yes, Melbourne, uh, Melbourne University did in fact offer a Master of Cultural Material Conservation. Um, however, it, had, it was a number of years before I actually got on the plane and came over here. The main thing for me was the fact that I was moving to a new country. I was leaving my family and everything I knew, and I'm talking I've got a huge family, very, very close-knit family too, so that was really, really, it played a lot on my mind and it was one of the, the hardest things that I've ever, ever had to do. Anyway, so my partner, who I'd not long met beforehand, um, he basically said to me, look, if you don't do it now, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. Um, and I think I made the decision knowing that he was coming with me. I applied for university. I got into university. I applied for um, an Indigenous fellowship that was offered at the time. However, just to make things a little bit more exciting, uh, we found out we were pregnant just before I got on the plane. So that changed things up a little bit. So a degree that was to take two years full-time uh, became a full four-year part-time degree. And, of course, you know, just to, add, or just to make things a little bit more exciting, we ended up having a second child during that time. But um, I don't regret it anyway because... It was probably the best decision I actually made because I was able to actually enjoy motherhood at the same time as pursuing a degree. So yeah, so I studied at Melbourne University. I did it part-time over four years. The reason being is because there is no degree in cultural materials conservation in New Zealand. So I started as a conservator. I was really, really lucky um, that while I was while I was actually studying, um, I landed my first job as an assistant conservator halfway through to my degree. So um, that was the beginning of a really long, um, ongoing relationship with 
uh, Melbourne Museum. So that is where I guess my career developed from. One of my most favourite projects, I think, would have been not long after uh, actually starting at Melbourne Museum, I was brought on in a more full-time capacity to actually assist with the redevelopment of First Peoples Exhibition at Melbourne Museum. Now, that uh, was a huge redevelopment, which which had been five years in the planning and making. Um, basically, the gallery that showcased Indigenous cultures in Victoria and South East Australia was being redeveloped to actually better represent the stories of community and the people of the area more appropriately. And in doing so, it was actually um, bringing out a lot more of the collection. So the lead conservator, because she her her um, responsibilities and her time was being taken up through meetings and um, basically representing the conservation aspect of the development phase. She needed an assistant to actually come and do the the, assist, uh, the assessments and the condition reports and everything else required um, to prepare the objects for display. So basically, I was thrown in the deep end very fast. Um, as an assistant conservator, I basically I had the the minimum um, required to actually work in conservation, but being brought in on a more full time capacity meant that I had to learn systems and processes very fast and I had to actually adapt to a really fast pace and a really fast changing exhibi- exhibition environment. So it basically it was me, it was just me. I mean she was there to check, check things and just make sure I was actually on track. However um, the project management and everything else really came down to me because it was it soon became my responsibility to actually um, locate and track and process and get around about three three and a half thousand four thousand indigenous objects prepared for exhibition obviously not all of them actually went on display in the end however um, everything needed to be ready to go and um, I've got so many memories of that of actually locating and having these objects and moving them out right before uh, the doors were actually going to open for the exhibition, Um, even doing things really like right at the last minute. So it really, really showed me just how, I guess, diverse and how ever-changing an exhibition environment um, really can be. I guess one of the key things I learnt from that experience was just how adaptable a conservator really has to be. Uh, so yeah, that was that was a that was a great experience. It was definitely an eye opener, and it was a great introduction to um, conservation in the museum context. So I'm actually really thankful and grateful for that experience now, <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> but yeah, so okay, so what's the scariest thing you've ever found in a pest trap? Pest trap? I had to really think about this one. Um, it's been a long time since I've actually checked, checked the pest trap. Because, um, as, as a private conservator, I don't really get called upon too much to actually do IPM or anything like that. However, when I was at the museum, um, that was one of my main jobs working in preventive conservation, was to actually monitor and manage uh, the IPM for a good chunk of the museum. And I think one of the, the scariest things I actually really came across, I achieved a, a house scorpion. So they've got some really crazy bugs and stuff down here in Australia, just all sorts of nasty things, really. I mean, you always you always got things like clothes moths and cockroaches and all that kind of stuff, all your general sort of household pests. But I remember coming across a household scorpion, and I was thinking, oh, my God, what is that? So, yeah, that definitely gave me a fright and they are quite literally just tiny miniature versions of those ones that you do see on the movies um however without the the deathly color or the the big nasty nippers at the back i mean they have nippers but they don't they're nothing like um the larger versions of them um but yeah apparently quite a common house pest here um but it's quite harmless um i've heard <laughs> although you wouldn't think looking at them. Um, so, yeah, that's my contribution. Um, i just like to say great work, guys. I'm loving your guys' podcast. Um, keep up the great work, and I can't wait to hear what comes next. Thank you so much, Arina. That was that was so interesting to hear from you and from a freelancer as well. Uh, it strikes me that we're all so similar as people. We all come from the same places in our interests, the same thing, sort of things drive us. We face the same sorts of issues as of, of funding, but to different extents, uh, lack of jobs and everything. 
And it's the difference in our backgrounds and the ways that we find conservation that guides our attitudes to it and how we work with material. So I'm really, I've really loved hearing about everybody. Really, really lovely. Oh, yeah, I agree. We have one to read out. Don't yes, we? we do. We have one to read out. Uh, not everyone managed to get us an actual voice clip, but we did say that we would uh, read this one out. Starting with, hello, uh, what is your name and where do you work? Hello, I'm Chi Chun Lin. I am a project assistant in the National Museum of Taiwan Literature in Tainan City, Taiwan. Uh, I'm helping the museum to catalogue and fill uh, in museum object documents. Sometimes I help with the paper conservators doing simple treatments and learnings and knowledge about paper conservation. How did you get into conservation and where did you train? I was a college student of art history. During our learning project, uh, there were several courses about conservation that attracted my attention and brought me into the conservation field. Uh, my teacher, Miss Wang, inspired my interest to study conservation, so I chose the same area, uh, UK, uh, to have my master's degree. Oh, that's so good. Uh, what's been your favourite project uh, or object and what were the main challenges with it? Ceramic and bronze are my favourite. For me, it was, hard, uh, it was hard to identify corrosion products and bronze and uh, how much should be cleaned up. During a few years of working, I found that uh, having an object conservative position in Taiwan is more difficult. Most museums and studios are focused on paper, photographs, textiles and oil paintings, but not really inorganic materials. I'm hoping they'll one day need a conservator for a different material. And what's the scariest thing you found <laughs> in a pest trap? The C word. Cockroaches. Uh, <laughs> Everyone has cockroaches. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for that. Oh, Thank you so much to everyone who contributed. We really appreciate it. And we loved hearing from you. It was fantastic. And uh, if any of you, you know, want to get in touch now, you know, on Twitter or anything and tell us more about uh, your work uh, and where in the world you are, then please feel free. We love hearing from you. Today I'm reviewing a book called Treasures and Trusted Hands, Negotiating the Future of Colonial Cultural Objects. This is Volume 3 of Clues, Interdisciplinary Studies in Culture, History and Heritage, and is published by Sidestone Press. Author is Joss van Burden. This book is split into six parts and covers topics such as why repatriation of artefacts matters. I'd really hope that most museum professionals could have some understanding of this already, but a primer is always a good idea. How colonialism led to the redistribution of cultural material legal matters, and several case studies. The author is Dutch, so the emphasis is on example from the Netherlands, but there are also plenty of international case studies included. Colonial is here defined as 15th century to independence sought by the colonies, so it spans a fair bit in terms of time, especially when it comes to museum collecting and acquisitions. It does raise interesting questions about things like the life of museum objects and how we treat them. Would our records adequately tell their stories in our galleries, labs and stores if returned, for example? Would anyone bother telling the original culture receiving it back what is actually, you know, what has actually happened to the object while in our care? As a conservator interested in what we'd call ethnography, anthropology or world culture collections, I found this book well-researched and interesting, but perhaps not relevant to my work as such. The book is a little heavy going, as it is very scholarly, being a repurposed doctoral thesis, if I understand correctly. But perhaps interesting for those who work with world culture collections. There's little for conservators, as this isn't a conservation book as such. Instead, this is all about ethical ramifications and also different types of collecting. (laughs) Gifts to administrators or institutions, private expeditions, military expeditions, missionary collecting and archives are all covered. It summarises the problems with colonial objects well and offers some insight into how countries, but arguably not museums themselves, can tackle these issues. This is something you should have on your bookshelf if you're a curator, lecturer or student of anthropology or a genuine repatriation buff. This book has 290 pages in its softback version, was published in 2017 and is available from Sidestone Press for €29.95. You can also read it online for free. Alternatively, you can buy it from Amazon for £35.
Dear Jane, I'm going to study conservation in the UK soon, but I plan on working in other countries across the world when I graduate. Do you think my qualification will mean something overseas? Dear future student, first of all, let me apologise for any background noise. We've got builders in both my house and my work, so I'm recording this in the park. You inquired about your British qualification for conservation, and let me first reassure you by saying yes, I think a degree from a British university is well recognised and respected around the world. What's more, I think a degree in conservation from a British university will be well recognised and exceptionally well taken because there is a great tradition of conservation teaching in the UK. But I suppose I don't really want to end it there and talk a little bit more about how you get the opportunities that you're hoping. Because the degree, travel, fees is a big commitment. So it's important that you get what you want out of your time at university. So what would I recommend that you do? You probably have a sense of the places that you want to work or the kind of skills and kind of tasks you want to undertake. So think about how you can use your time at university to build up evidence and interest and engagement with those things. If there's a particular country or region that you're interested in, make sure that you visit museums, art galleries or whatever around the UK that have temporary or permanent exhibitions related to that country, region or topic. There's nothing that impresses people more than the fact that you already know about their materials, their history, their artistic traditions. It shows that you're committed and that you're interested. People always want to employ people who have got a track record of liking this topic and haven't just invented that when the job application came in. You're working on your portfolio when you're a student. Concentrate on the skills. Don't worry too much that you have to have exactly like-for-like materials, but find out what kind of skills you will need to demonstrate in a job in the areas that you're targeting. Is it you need to work particularly with June Fori? Do you have to particularly be able to wash paper? Do you have to um, have a keen understanding of traditional manufacturing materials? Those sorts of things will help you pick and shape your portfolio items. So I would do that research. Another thing you can do while you're studying your degree is build up all the power skills. So, for example, if you've gone to go to Antarctica or to field work, then you're probably going to have to show that you can survive the lifestyle. A little bit of mountain walking, for example, wouldn't do any harm. Show them that you could live in a tent for eight weeks without any problems. Or it might be about language acquisition. Even learning a little bit of language would be useful. You might also want to add to your skill set and be one of those generally useful people to have around by picking up a first aid qualification, a construction site safety qualification, something like that. English as a foreign language even, as a TEFL course, can be quite useful because people always find it useful to have other skills. The other thing that I was going to say is that you'll probably do a placement as part of your course. Don't worry again about making your placement a perfect fit. After all, life is a journey. You never know where it's taking you. But what you do need to worry about is making sure that on your placement, you're engaged, enthusiastic, give everything you can, ask questions, offer solutions, and just generally be one of the team. Conservation is a small world, and people will know each other wherever you go and we'll ask around you so make sure you make a good impression also let me deal with a practical issue which is your transcript although when you graduate you'll get a certificate with a stamp on it saying what you've achieved you want to try and get a transcript that says a little bit more about your degree as this will be asked for in some countries make sure that you get a a certificate that says what each of the modules that you took is but also a description of what was covered in that module make sure that you get your mark put on it and that you then get that stamped by any official stamps that you can get your hands on and get as many people as you can get your hands on to sign it. While you're doing that, make sure you get a reference written. Try and get two, get them PDF'd in advance. That just explains, you know, all your skills and qualities that you can take with you. If you're travelling and trying to find work in different places, you're going to want to be agile. So it's important not to have to wait two or three weeks for a reference if you ask just in the middle of exam season. If you've already got that ready, it might be that the first person through the door gets the contract. So try to do that. And lastly, and by no means least, because it's a constant theme of the C word, make sure you network. Network, network, network. Get on Twitter, follow people, read their blogs, ask questions on their blogs. Get engaged with people in the areas and things that you're interested in. The bigger your network, the more likely you are to find out about opportunities, for people to think of you as being someone who's interested in that sort of thing. I wish you the very best of luck with all of this. And after you've graduated and been working around the world for a couple of years, perhaps you can come back onto the C-Word podcast to tell us all how it went. 
Au revoir. Nacht. Thanks for listening. We're the C Word, and you've been listening to Nerys Rudder, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jennifer Fierson. Join us next time for an episode about being heard. In the meantime, check out our website at thecword.show. Tweet us at the C Word Podcast, or simply email us on thecwordpodcast at gmail.com. Intro and outro music is Spring by Dida Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. 